Hello and welcome to the Virtualization and Cloud Security Podcast, episode 163 or so, and um, it's about our 15th or so video podcast. I'd like to welcome our guest today, who is Faru Mabatuna, who is the CEO and founder of NetSparker, as well as their chief architect. And why don't you tell us a little bit about NetSparker? Sure. Uh, NetSparker is a web application security scanner that tests web applications and web services automatically to find vulnerabilities. That's pretty short and succinct, but I think it's more than that. It's also a sandboxing technology. You put, do all your testing in a sandbox so that you can deploy multiples of these throughout your environment as they're needed. Right. We have, we have two solutions effectively. One is NetSparker Desktop, which is a traditional Windows desktop software that you double-click, install, run, and all that. And then we have NetSparker Cloud, which you can use as a software as a service. And it, it's, you know, it, it's on the cloud, so it's scalable. If you want to scan 1,000 web applications within eight hours, you can do that. And you can, if you like, deploy it internally on your company's infrastructure. And you can even hook it up with your own cloud API if you have one internally. If you have any kind of virtualization inside, yeah, you can do that. So we do support that as well. So I see NetSparker fitting into what I call the secure agile cloud de development architecture as a way of doing functional testing. It's not designed, I mean, is it designed for doing 200,000 sessions in a minute or is it more designed for the 1,000, 2,000 range? Um, it's, it's effectively scalable. It's all about uh, how much resources you want to allocate. If you want to do scan, you know, 5,000 applications at the very same time, you can, you can effectively do that. Well, That's what fine. I'm, what I'm thinking about is actually one application, the one I'm currently working on. If I'm developing an application for, and I want to do, put it out there as fast as possible mm -hmm. for a continuous integration, continuous deployment, I finish the sprint, right. I do the final build, I build all my artifacts, and now what I need to do is do some level of security testing to make sure it's not going to be broken as soon as I put it out there. I mean, zero days are prevalent in websites. And that's how they get hacked. No matter mm -hmm. what type of web application firewall is in front of it, they will be hacked. So right. I see NetSpark of fitting in and meeting that need of, hey, after I do the build, run a test in an automated yeah. fashion, talking to Jenkins, talking to the SaaS service or whatever, deploy it, put it out there, and test. Oh, definitely. That's, that's the best way to do it, really. And maybe the most important aspect of it, due to development, uh, what is really nice, when you make a change, when you commit it to your continuous integration, so, you know, your code, source code repository, then continuous integration picks it up, and right after the build, if you can get the feedback from your scanner, like NetSpark, then what, what will happen, your developer will be aware that they just introduced, or you just introduced a vulnerability in the last 10 lines of code, you just commit. And that's, that's perfect because you know where the problem is. It's fresh, you can fix it, and you're just development. It's not in production, so it's not dangerous yet. You are just fixing the vulnerability just as you introduced it, and you learn the mistake, you know how to fix it now, and you won't repeat that. So it's like a... Partially, you learn as you develop, and you get that feedback immediately, right after you commit, not six months down the line, just before you deploy it, you know. Well, most people not, are yeah. every couple hours, too, and if they're doing, or every 15 minutes, and even if they're doing that, this won't actually slow them down any if it's automated. Correct, yeah. It's, it's all automated, it's kind of transparent. And it's great because, you know, traditionally you can say, as I said, the security testing almost as an afterthought. And then what happens is you develop your application and then before you go alive or you hit a deadline or deploy a new feature, what happens is you hire some consultancy. So they come in and then they find issues. Now you have a deadline and now you have to fix so many issues. And the chances are. Because you didn't know you introduced a vulnerability, possibly you introduced those vulnerabilities many times now. And it's all over your application. Now you have to change every single one of them, maybe centralize, maybe change even the structure of it. Because with the design you have, it just doesn't work out because it's not secure. Well, and the nice thing about this is that if I'm a developer, I can deploy it locally 
I can develop, I can do my builds locally, and part of that build process should be identical to the build process we use for CICD, and that is launch NetSparker with inside of the sandbox, and Bob's your uncle, you get that immediately before even source code is committed. That's correct, yeah. And then, then you can do a, a, a much more refined one once source code is committed. I can now do an official one that's for the product. And as you said, I'm learning all along. How many of these can I chain together? I mean, how many different vulnerabilities do you scan for? Oh, I don't have a number top of my head. It's a lot. I mean, there are two, two set of vulnerabilities. The first set of vulnerabilities are, well, you can say, uh, class of vulnerabilities, such as SQL injection, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery. There is no signature. They are like different in all the applications. Yep. So yeah, that's why the NetSparker comes in. It heuristically figures out those issues. And then you have a fixed set of vulnerabilities. And yeah, they are mostly about, imagine that in your application, you left the debugger environment enabled. Oh, yeah. Or you left the errors enabled, like you can see stack tr traces, all that kind of stuff, the stuff that you shouldn't be able to see. So these are more signature checks. And in total, I think we have maybe, I don't know, 500, less, more. I, I don't know the exact number really. Well, and then not only that, you, do you have a, a, I mean, most people that do testing, security testing, you provide a feed so that the, you're constantly updating the database or updating oh, yeah. the software with a, a threat feed for their industry. So. And I'm assuming you guys do that as well. But if you can Definitely. bring that in and tie that to their testing in an automated fashion, you know, this is this is gold for training your developers. Oh, we even do uh, kind of cool stuff such as, you know, other than the traditional version testing, if your PHP is out of date, yeah, we will tell you that. If your operating system somehow we know that and is out of date, we will tell you that. But also something cool we recently introduced is checking for client-side version issues. Like, you, are, you know, nowadays, all these new web applications, we have so many third-party JavaScript libraries that we use. Yep. Some of them coming through CDN, some of them we host them. And when we don't update them, because we don't like to update them, it breaks stuff. Yep. <laughs> uh, NetSpike also determines them on runtime. And that's great. So, for example, even if you are loading multiple JavaScripts after you launch the website, so your browser renders new JavaScript, it's not static, statically linked, but J JavaScript dynamically loads them. NetSparker can figure out them and knows the version of them and then tell you if that version has a vulnerability. It tells you, look, there are all these vulnerabilities, you should really update this. Or this is out of date, but we don't have any security issues with it just yet. Okay, so that's actually good. So now you're not only checking the, the server side, but also what the client's doing. Now, how do you do that? Do you do that by actually putting in some sort of JavaScript that queries all that information or kind of like a real a, a user monitoring tool that is put out there by Dynatrace and or New Relic and or AppDynamics and a few like Eternity and so forth? Or are you literally doing this in tests that says we're going to try 17,000 of these and these are the ones you have problems with? Mm -hmm. the, in that particular engine, what we do, we got pretty much three steps. One of them is server-side check. So when we load the JavaScript statically, we receive the HTTP response, and we know the hash of it, and we compare it with the hash that we have the database for. And our database is constantly updated. Every other week, we update it. So if I query Node.js, do you use Node.js, or if I query, yeah. use jQuery, or whatever one I'm doing, you're going to look at it and say, oh, this is the most recent version, this is the hash of that, this is what Correct. you downloaded. This one has a vulnerability, this one does not. Correct, and that's one of the steps. But going forward, I think the, the latest stage of it, you know, it, it improves the accuracy. We actually load your page on an actual browser. We use the Chromium engine mm -hmm. for the underlying browser. And then we actually query in JavaScript levels. So because, yes. you know, now we are on JavaScript runtime, we can just ask jQuery, what's your version? And obviously that will be perfectly correct. Well, then that's what I was, that's the next question I was having is because of all the sorts of CDNs out there in use, you mm -hmm. don't know where it's being served up from. So doing it that way, I, that's actually much better. Yeah, it's, it's very accurate. So we got levels of it. Whatever is necessary, we will do that. And that's, again, it's very cool because if you're loading your JavaScript dynamically, runtime is the only place you can look at almost. 
and now we got obviously you're familiar with all the you know packing javascripts together there are just so many hacks around so hashing itself is just not good enough and do you also look for the cdns to see if they're good cdns versus bad cdns well that's not something we are checking for now mostly because cdn is such a you know hard to figure out concept right and there are just so many custom cdns you cannot just classify well, you do, know uh, the, you do know the really good ones automatically, you know. I mean, okay, yeah. Know, it, it, there are some like Google, well-known CDN mm-hmm. for, Java, mm-hmm. for jQuery and a few other JavaScript things. You know where the base is. I mean, like Mac right. CDN and all the other ones are out there. I mean, WP Engine has a CDN. Mm-hmm. So and they use NetCDN. So there's a whole bunch of well-known ones where there's a bunch that may not be known. Right, right. What we do, we do not, you know, kind of be judge of that and tell the customer that, you know, this is good, this is bad. But we will show you a list of all the external JavaScript resources and any kind of ex- external resource that you embed, which can control on your website, on the client side, which can lead a cross-site scripting. We will report all of those. And then as the user, you can say, okay, you know, this looks good. Or you can say, I don't know this URL. I don't even know why it's here. You know, it might be loaded by another tool you are using. You know, sometimes you use a JavaScript, which loads another JavaScript from another domain that you you don't even know. So it's it's kind of good to get a picture of that. It is. And then you can actually track back and say, this called this, this called this, and this included this, and so forth. Right. And as a developer, you should know what you're using. Oh yeah, um, and it's it, trust. Yeah. When you when you use a JavaScript from another domain, you explicitly trust them. And if they got hacked or if they somehow became malicious, then they can execute cross-site scripting, they can execute JavaScript on your website, which means they can hack the sessions. You know, they can do so many nasty stuff. Let's say if they do to an admin user, they will be able to get into the website, comp- they will take over the website completely because they will hijack the admin session. But also you're checking, are you je- you're checking against everything against also, say for example, I'm using a bunch of includes, are you checking against the vulnerability databases that exist for JavaScript and so forth? Oh yeah, I mean, we, we hold our own database. So we, we keep a track of all the popular JavaScript, not all of them. Uh, we, we keep and a keep, track of all the popular ones. And you keep track of all the CVEs and CVNs and all Correct. That. That's okay. correct. Everything relevant to web application security and what we check for, we keep a track of them. And as I said, we update them every other week. That's our routine unless there's something, you know, urgent comes in. So, I mean, I'm looking at the process as this, is that the developer writes some code in mm-hmm. JavaScript, C, PHP, Python, Ruby, whatever. Erlang, Go, whatever they want to write in. They submit it. Well, they build it there first. And my opinion is, is that whatever they build with should be exactly what's being done for the final production. So it should be, for example, the same automation tool, Jenkins, Ansible, Vagrant, whatever. I build it, deploy it into a sandbox, mm-hmm. test it, and part of that build and deploy, in my mind, should be an automated functional test. Right. Which, that's where NetSpark comes in, because as, as soon as I say I'm using Jenkins, I can easily, or Ansible, I can easily say, hey, put it out there and then run a script or run something, maybe even a puppet or chef script that says, hey, start up NetSparker mm-hmm. as part of that build. And when it finishes, if the build was successful and this was successful, then it says, okay, everything's gold, now play with it. Right. Now, once right. you play with it, you make a change, you go through the same process, and that process shouldn't take more than five to ten, five minutes or so. I mean, it's very quick, or it can be. Right, yeah. I mean, the testing bit can differ, but we have options to speed it up. We have options such as incremental scanning, as we call it, that you will only check, test what has been changed. Well, and on a website, that could be everything, even though I change 10 lines over in this little routine right. over here, it changes the whole flow of the website. So now it's reflowing 14 times and... Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. affecting performance the way I didn't know it. So not only do I need NetSparker tied into all this as a functional level test and a security right. level test, but I also need an APM tool, an application performance management tool, to get feedback to say how many reflows I've done, 
I mean, all this stuff that you need for web applications to say they're fast. Oh, and definitely. Yeah, that fast. will... And if you don't have that as part of your development, I think you're missing a big part of the, the picture. Oh, I agree. I mean, we internally, on our Netspark development, for example, we got a similar setup. When we build an inversion, it's gone through... Um, you know, about 1,500 unit tests and then about 2,000 functional tests all automatically. And all these functional tests are, imagine, you know, we are talking about SQL injection. We have like 400 variations of it with different backend databases, with different languages, with different web applications, with different edge cases. And only way to be sure that you haven't broken anything and you still cover everything with every changes, you know, every line changes. You have to do that excessive regression testing, and that's part of our process. And without that, I don't think you can develop a complex application. It's just not feasible, almost. You know, it's very uh, if you don't play, it's buggy, it's tricky, it's it really hard. Well, what it does is it makes your your end users beta testers, and they just don't like that anymore. They're getting right. tired of it. They don't want broken code. They want it just to work. So, the more we automate, the better off we are. But this, yes. I see two places for this is your incremental as I'm doing development and building and rebuilding and rebuilding before I commit. And then when I do the, the build for all the developers, that's when I would do a heavyweight run through everything. Mm -hmm. The question, though, is how long would that take for everything instead of an incremental? Incremental could take minutes and everything could right. take, take how long? It depends, really. It, it heavily depends on the application. If it's a small application with the certain settings you are using, it can be 10 minutes. If it's a big application, it can literally take eight hours. Okay. So, yeah, it, it can do that. But it's, again, you know, how you optimize it, what you want to test. You can limit it. Uh, you can make it faster. But, for example, you can say, okay, you don't need to understand JavaScript and go ahead and scan my website. But if you have a single page application, then you really want to spend a lot of time understanding those JavaScripts because something NetSpark can support, but very, very heavy process. And that's the problem with continuous integration, continuous deployment is always saying, I want to be able to do that as fast as possible and doing mm -hmm. it in eight hours is not a good idea. So right. those companies no, are deploying every 15 minutes, they'll just say, hey, we'll just eat the security problem the next time we come around. But you know, I have one company I do work for that does 4 billion queries in a day. Mm -hmm. And they introduced one thing, and they do A-B testing because of the load requirements. 4 billion, ses four billion sessions in a day is a lot. A lot. <laughs> yeah, and they know within five minutes of running something, some new code, whether or not it's going to impact performance. They right. really went right. on that one server from 200,000 sessions in a minute down to 50,000 sessions in a minute. Mm -hmm. That to them was a performance hit. That's not good. So they basically rolled it back and fixed the problem and then rolled it out again for another test. That's a very fairly manual process for these guys. And it took only 10 minutes, but still a lot of non, there's some automation in there, but not a huge amount, mainly because humans have to initiate the automation. Mm -hmm. Instead of actually saying, okay, tie it to a build and so forth. That's just trust. These guys trust the humans more than they trust automation. Right, right. That, that's another thing about automation. I mean, when you have automation that you can trust, as a developer, you are more free to develop stuff. You know, you can write code and only think about the code that you are writing, not the pieces that you might be breaking right now. Exactly. Because, you know, if you break something, you will immediately get that feedback or very quickly get that feedback. But if you don't have that trust, then writing code gets much more complicated because now you think about so many pieces in your head while trying to solve what you are trying to solve. <laughs> yeah. Well, it also comes down to functional versus scale testing. If I'm mm -hmm. a functional test, I want to make sure the ones we're looking for are the repeatable errors, the ones that oh, yeah. repeat all the time, every session. At a scale level, we're looking at things like memory problems and things that build up over time. And if you don't do both... <laughs> You end up with something that will break eventually or almost immediately, depending on the scale of your application. If your scale is no more than 10,000 sessions in a minute, any, almost any tool can do that. The question is whether or not they can do it fast enough. Right. Now, 
I mean, I know a couple of tools that can do scale testing and do, they have 6,000 tests, they can run one a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still 6,000 minutes. It's still a long time. You know, that's too long for, that's way too long. We need things that'll get an answer in 10 minutes at most, sometimes. So what do we recommend for those people that need to go faster and faster that do we find, is there a way to get out of these build, these feeds of errors, those things that are most likely for that category of product? Do you have anything like that? Well, definitely. We have something called optimization. We have a visit and you can then go diving into details and change so many things. To, to give you a most obvious example, if you are building a PHP application, you don't need to look for .NET framework relevant vulnerabilities. You know, you don't want to waste your time with that. So you can just take them out and that will save a lot of time. What about medical? I mean, if you're talking about a vertical and I know that banking or medical or whatnot, do you have anything that's specific to the verticals? Because some attacks oh, are much is... more prevalent. We are mostly relevant to the tech. So it, it affects what your database, you know, based on your database, based on your framework, based on the language, based okay. on the operating system. That all affects and we have automated optimization for them. And then the next thing you might do, okay, as I said, what is my application? Is the JavaScript heavy application? Is the single page application? Or is it almost no JavaScript, straightforward HTML? And then you can say, okay, you know what? You don't have to simulate my pages or do limited simulation. For example, in a single page application, we can, NetSparker can simply easily spend minutes on one page because you are trying to find every single combination from a, you know, uh, from a dynamic point of view. And that's a complicated problem. Yes, it is. But, but if you are only looking at a simple web application or a simple JavaScript interaction application, now you don't need that. You can just pass the HTML or traverse through the DOM without actually touching or executing any JavaScript. And you will be fine and it will be very accurate. So it's all kind of trade of all these, you know, optimizations. Okay. So when, but the other thing is, is that from those people that are in those verticals, I'm assuming that based on configuration and an API, I can actually pick and choose those tests that are most important to that vertical. So for example, if I get a threat feed and I'm a hospital or a medical, mm -hmm. I'm looking at threat feeds and threats towards medical. And those, I should be able to take the threat feed and say, oh, you know what? cross-site scripting seems to be the, the prevalent attack this, this mm -hmm. day or this hour or this week or this month in this region of the country or world, I should make sure I run all those. Oh, you can definitely do that. And maybe one nice way to implement this into continuous integration is you can run a limited set of, as we call it, policy, a limited policy that checks for only certain stuff that's more common that you have seen in the past and all that kind of stuff. And then you can do nightly checks, which more extensive. How many, I mean, the other thing I was thinking about, say I want out fast, I do my quick test. Mm -hmm. and it comes out and then I do my scale test for quick test. But mm -hmm. as I'm running those in parallel, I'm running everything. So the initial continuous integration to, to continuous deployment test is saying, hey, run the most popular, the OWASP top 20 or whatever it right, is. Right, yeah. And yeah. say, okay, did we break those? Any of the known zero days for whatever build you're using, uh, framework we're using. If those all pass, yeah, go ahead and send it out. Make a decision that says, yes, you can go on to the next stage or whatever that stage is, whether it's human involvement that's mm -hmm. looking at performance management to make another decision or a log analysis to make even another decision. Some of those go, no go for CICD. Let's assume everything's go, it goes out. Right. But I'm also running in parallel several other types of tests. And so when those come back with data, it could be major failures or not. And I may have to do a rollback based on that result. So oh. I'm assuming I can do that. Oh, definitely, yeah. And it makes much more sense to do a lot more in parallel because you do know security testing, even functional testing, not even to ignore security, mm -hmm. full functional testing could take hours or days. Right, right. Yeah, it depends on the scale, what you're looking for. In, in, you know, one well, option is, as you said. On the application. I mean, you may say, okay, front end, no login, 
that's what we're looking mm -hmm. at. That's the vast majority. Okay, now I need to log in. That right. might be a different set of tests, so I actually can do in test to a couple different functional tests that are really, really fast. It's like front end, no login, login only, test those first couple of pages mm -hmm. or whatever it is, and then the full-blown thing parallel to that, and maybe three or four of those testing various different security things and functional things so that I get quick answers and then get my slower answers over time, but I get enough in parallel that I can actually get a better set of a better result. And then I come back to this go, no go. It's like, well, did that work? Did that work? Did that work? No. Yes. Do I go? Do I not? When I do go, I then say, okay, over time, I may have to pull back or just open up a bunch of, of calls that say, you know what? I got all these errors you need to fix. Mm -hmm. And actually, in, in our NetSparkle Cloud solution, uh, you can even get a trend matrix, as we call it. So you can see, I have done, let's say, 50 tests. 50 runs, and you can actually keep track of a particular vulnerability that's been identified a month ago and somehow fixed in the next version, let's say, and then for 30 scans, it wasn't there. And out of nothing, one day it came back. So the very same vulnerability in the very same place, and then we will report this as, okay, there's a vulnerability that we marked as revived, so you kind of see, okay, there's something wrong here about my deployment, the way I fix issues. If something is being fixed, why is it still here? I should never have that, right? So well, we, we no, kind of mark that as well. Well, there's that, but also the fact is, is that some of these attacks can be mitigated downstream before mm -hmm. they even hit the website. I know one site, for example, that has a well-known vulnerability, and they won't run without that vulnerability. Right? They <laughs> somehow did something. But they mitigate it downstream from them, so it, nothing that would eva to that would eviscerate that vulnerability or use it can actually even reach it. Right. So the whole mitigation has to be taken into effect count as well. It's like, oh, do I make a change to the load balancer or whatever to mitigate that? Mm -hmm. Saying you, they'll never reach it, and if they can't reach it, then you know you need to monitor it. Yes. So for this one, they monitor the vulnerability, make sure it's not hit. Right, um, right. At for outside, but internally, it's, it's hit a few times because that's how they build. I mean, it's just, just the way it is. It's also, you know, you can definitely do that kind of stuff. But what I've seen in, in my experience, uh, I've, I've worked as a penetration tester for so many years. So I've seen with NetSparker customers and before NetSparker, when I worked with companies as a consultant, what I have seen, when you have that kind of solution, so when you have something almost, let's say, acceptable risk, what happens is there is a way it will get exploited at one point. If you get a web application firewall, someone will bypass it. If you have exactly. an application that you only deploy, and your server is safe because you make a configuration on your Apache server, someone will deploy it to another server. You know, someone will upgrade that server and it will get so far and it's going to be vulnerable again. <laughs> but the main thing is, is that people, if you, have, if you know this and you're monitoring it. All right, monitoring is the key, I suppose. If you do that, then you should be good, obviously. Yeah. yeah and then you'll notice if it's being used. Right. Right, or that's correct. Yes. That's the only way around that. But there are some ways, some tools that work that way. And I agree that, you know, every vulnerability eventually will be hit. Mm. And, you know, it may take years. The, For example, the ASN vulnerability that was inside of um, OpenSSL has been there for yeah. decades. And it oh, wasn't yeah. until yeah. recently that they actually were, they knew about it for decades. It wasn't until recently that it was actually impacted mm -hmm. or made available. And they said made a big deal about it, but it's, Originally, it was not because it was impossible to reach it until they changed the code above it. Right, right, and right, right. That, that's a great example, yeah. yeah. So you need to be really careful if you are building in these well-known and acceptable risks. And as mm -hmm. a, I mean, NetSparker is not going to replace, or actually any of these tools will not fully replace a penetration test. No, because no, what we do... Because the penetration test has a human mind behind it and tries things right. that are abnormal all the time. To, to give you a good example, we got so many customers who are penetration testing companies, penetration testers, consultants, security consultants. The way they use NetSparker, and that's pretty much what we aim for. 
what we say, look, we automate what can be automated so you can spend your time into stuff that cannot be automated. Yeah. And that's the key. So as a security prof, you know, as a security consultant, as a penetration tester, if you are not automating your testing, either you are wasting your customer's time or your own time. Because put it this way, a simple SQL injection from a black box point of view, so without having to source code, you might actually end up, unless you do about 40 requests, HTTP requests, you don't know whether that vulnerability is in there or not. Let's say 10. Let's be more optimistic. And you know the database and a couple of other extra information. So the 10 requests you can figure out. Now, in a, in a simple application, you can easily get three parameters per page and easily get, let's say, 20 dynamic pages. And now what you're talking about, you, you're talking about, you know, 60. Uh, you're talking about 60 inputs. And then you will enter 10 different variations just to check one SQL injection. Now we are talking about over 100 requests. Okay, so we're actually talking about, you know, 600 requests just to check one vulnerability. So if as a penetration tester or as a security consultant, if you are manually doing this, you are really wasting your time. If you are not doing it, then you are not doing your job. So you really want to automate this. <laughs> well, and actually, if I'm a vendor, I mean, if I'm a, a, a software developer, having something like this makes my life a lot easier because it's testing all those well-known things. Oh, yeah. And, and, they, and, and I can actually, and I, I'm assuming I can provide those reports to the penetration testers and say, look, we've already tested this stuff. Here you go. And the penetration testers say, okay, you've got NetSparker. Let me try all these odd things that, that can't be automated. Today. Definitely, definitely. There are logical issues. There are other issues that only can be found by a human. But you can, if you can get your scanner, if you can get your NetSpiker and say, okay, here is the crawl list. NetSpiker will tell you what it's seen, what it's tested. So you know what's been tested for what. So now you know what is not being tested and cannot be automated. Then that's your job. Spend your time because you know you're expensive. You're a penetration tester, you, you work by the hour, you work by the day, you charge a lot, then you need to spend that time into important stuff, not the stuff a tool can do. That's, that's just not productive. <laughs> and now let's flip the coin here, is that there's actually three sides to this particular triangle. You've got penetration testers on one side, but you also have developers on the other. Mm -hmm. Developers will learn from their common mistakes. Oh, yeah. Way. I know developers. I'm a developer, and developers are notorious for saying, leave me alone, security lasts, let me just get the code working, and so forth. However, I think there needs to be a new type of developer, one that isn't a developer with a security mindset, who's paying attention to the net sparkers of the world and other tools to say, hey, I'm a security developer. I'm going to develop code. I'm going to make sure all these things are fixed. I'm going to make sure that I don't write code that's like that and mentor everybody else to do the exact same thing. So this is a tool that not only can help with, or a class of tools that not only can help with ensuring the security of your application, but it could train your people to be better. Definitely. And but... grow them internally to be have a security mindset to constantly continue looking at these. And these are going to be your, probably your most expensive, well-trained, well-lasting -last, long, long -lasting developers. They're hard to find. Correct. But I'm, I'm finding it, the problem with that, it's hard to blame the developers for not doing this. Because part of the problem is, and this is an even bigger problem with static analysis tools. Yes. You write a code and your static analysis tool tells you, you know what, you have just 1,000 issues. And then your developer goes to every single one of them and figures out, you know what, 800 of them just useless false positives, 100 of them just useless suggestions, and 100 of them arguable, and you actually end up with, okay, we found five issues, right? Well, the problem so, is, but what, it, what, but what all that did, even, even though they may be false positives, all that did was said, everybody, you're now looking at the code. You're, right. looking at no, it with an, you're looking at it with an analytical mindset and a security mm -hmm. mindset. However, most developers don't have that training, right? Those people that start this and do really well at this are going to be able to say, hey, I'm going to become that security developer. I'm going to have that mindset. I'm going to look at the code. And I'm going to work with the others to train them to not make those mistakes again. 
Some of it's going to be acceptable, but you need a couple of people looking at the code doing that. So as I said, one tri part of that triangle is the developer, and false positives today in static code analysis are well known. Dynamic code analysis or functional, the type of things that NetSpark or another mm -hmm. security testing tools do and functional testing tools do for scale is very different. It's kind of like I have my static code analysis, I run it, I use these other tools to verify those. Right. And, and for example, in NetSpark is something also we did to solve that problem. You know, what we had in the past with the developers, we had this issue. So you report something, a scanner reports something. And then the developer looks at it, and sometimes it turns out to be false positive. So the developer says, okay, you know, I've got 15 issues. The first is false positive, second is false positive, third is false positive. Then he's on the fourth, and he's checking it, and he cannot reproduce the vulnerability. But the reason, not that vulnerability is not there, but because he just couldn't reproduce, because he's not a security expert. He doesn't know how to do encoding properly in that level, maybe. You know, that's... that's that's acceptable, that's okay. So what happens is, then he just assumed it's yet another false positive. Yeah. So what we do with NetSparker to solve that, because I think that's a huge problem. And since we started, the first thing we developed, that's you know, you know, one of the key features of NetSparker, is we're not just telling you, telling you there is a SQL injection. We, NetSparker doesn't just tell you an attacker can or might steal your data. Instead, what it does, when there's a SQL injection, it tells you an attacker can steal data from your database, and you know what? I just did, and here is the data from your database. And so here's the request I made to, to steal it. Exactly. No, not just the request. It actually shows the data from the database. Well, it's the request so, and everything from that request. So it's basically right. storyline. Yeah, I mean, to, to give you an example, if we, if we are talking about a MySQL setup, then what NetSparker will show you, it will tell you, look, here is the version of your MySQL coming from your MySQL. And here is the name of the table. Here is the name of the database. And as a developer, when you see that, you immediately know two things. First, it's not a false positive. And second, it's real, it's proven, it's done, and I have to go ahead and fix it. And if I can, if this tool can get this, surely a hacker, an attacker, a malicious hacker or an attacker can hack into my application yeah. and definitely still much more important data. Absolutely. And so you're giving me a storyline of the story. You did the initial request. Here's the results or other series of requests I had to make to get the data. Mm -hmm. so and, the and the data itself as well. In the data itself, so the developer has exactly what's required to right. reproduce it. And that's great. And that's exactly what honestly, they do. They don't even need to reproduce it because the purpose of reproducing is generally to prove that the vulnerability no, 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 exists. What I'm saying is, is if I'm doing a build and I'm trying to fix that problem, I need the exact thing to reproduce it. So now it becomes something I run as part of my development cycle. All right, you, say, can, hey, you can do that. I fixed the code, let me reproduce mm -hmm. it. Nope, it didn't reproduce, send it on to the next light, or build right. it, send it on to NetSparker. It can't reproduce it, or it can. It gives you the storyline again. Now I got a new request that I have to fix for. So Right, right, that's definitely something you can do. And as you said, in NetSparker, we have a feature called retest, so you can just, okay, I fixed this, retest this, and then it will tell you it's still there, or if it's been fixed now. And that's actually very good, but it'll also tell you, oh, you missed this other one that's down the line. You, this, you did this one first, now you're open to these others. Because right. even though you retest, it's like you may still made a mistake. I mean, mm -hmm. think about this way. I mean, to all the developers out there, I mean, I'm a developer. I've actually written in my life 12 perfect lines of code. That's it. First time, first run, no vulnerabilities, no mistakes, nothing. 12 perfect lines Compiles. of code. Compiles. <laughs> it, it, it compiled first time with no problems. 12 perfect lines of code. That's the most I've ever been able to put together without something going wrong. You know, when you think about that, in the millions of lines of code that I've worked on, I trust my tools to tell me compile problems, problems with having extra data in it. We need to trust our tools to tell us we have security problems or even functional problems or performance problems, and they have to be part of this process. No developer's perfect. And you don't live in an island. We live as a team, so we have to all work together. And these are the tools to help us do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there are all these automation available. 
So it it's almost doesn't make sense why you don't utilize it. You know, it can make your life easier. It can make your expenses lower. It means you will deal with bugs today as you develop them, rather than six months down the line, someone is sending you a report and telling you, look, we are going to deploy this or three months or one month or one week. Someone is telling you, we're going to deploy it, but we cannot. It's, it's bad. It's vulnerable. It's, it's not secure. So we got to do two. I mean, basically, we're looking as fast as possible. Some companies deploy every 15 minutes. Some companies are every two hours, some every four days, once a day, whatever it is, or three times a day. Whatever it is, you still need to meet those rhymes, those <clears throat> requirements and those timings, but also run all these tests in the background so they're continually going on so that you can roll back, fix, whatever. And those, that's kind of the key, and it has to be automated. You can't, no human can do it fast enough. No. The other thing that is the third side of this triangle, I think, is auditing. If I'm running a tool like NetSpark or some of the others in this class of tools, and there's a few others out there, I now can provide to my auditors a list of all the tests I did for the OWASP top 20, let's say, and that may be all they care about. You know, now this is something incredibly valuable to the auditing team to say, yes, we did test it, we did meet compliance, check. Right, right. And also, when you don't, when you don't meet the compliance, you immediately know that. You know that when your auditing team comes in or when they, you know, when this external company comes in to do your test for PCI or whatever, then you know, okay, we're not going to pass that because we know we are not, you know, we, we don't comply with it yet. We need to fix this first to be, you know, to comply. And that's a big deal. I mean, most people right now don't know what they have to fix to be compliant. Right. And finding that, you no, know, PCI compliance is the most proscriptive compliance out there. But a lot of it is, you know, make sure you don't fail an OWASP top 20 test. I mean, if I can report on just those, <laughs> you know, this is a big deal. Compliance oh, yeah. says, I got a good feeling about your code. Hey, even though you got these other things, other problems, you pass the OWASP top 20. That should be like a compliance goal in my mind. And, and maybe something that we are overlooking and that I see a lot being, being overlooked. What happens is we are not only talking about cross-site scripting, SQL injection, this kind of stuff that you just got like immediately hacked almost. But there are other issues as well. Like, do you mark your cookies as secure, right? You are using an HTTPS. If you are not using, well, you got another issue. But now you are using, but do you mark them as secure? If you're not, then you got a big problem. And let's say you marked, but have you applied HSTS? Right? So it, it doesn't just tell you, you know, you got all these big issues, but it also tells you, look, there are all these best practice, and there is all other bits that you really need to do, even though it's just a simple flag in your cookie, unless you have it, you don't have a secure HTTPS implementation. It's still very insecure. It's still not working as it's supposed to. Absolutely. And these are, I mean, these are all major deals for compliance today, especially oh, yeah. cookies in Europe are just through the roof with compliance <laughs> requirements. And you can, cookies in the US, not as much, except in some industries. So we got to pay attention to all this. So there's actually three sides to why you need a, a functional and or security testing tool at this at, at this type. It's full automation for the developer to learn, to help the develop. I mean, that's basically just notification. Just plain old, give me a give me a notification that I have this problem as quickly as possible. As part of my build, as part of everything for continuous integration, continuous deployment, have it feed into my ticketing system so I can get it fixed in the next sprint if I have to, or a go, no go decision. My developers learn because right. they're constantly fixing these problems so they know how to fix them. And if the code is like, hey, go look at this, this is how you fix a cross site scripting attack or an SQL injection, that's actually information they need. And the third one is for auditing purposes so that you can actually hand it off to the auditors and you can hand it off to the, the, the penetration testers to say, hey, we already do this. Start somewhere new. You're right. Yeah, spend your time on something that haven't been tasked. So, you know, you can actually get the value out of your time. And run them in parallel. And actually, the funny thing is, you could actually give this to your penetration tester and say, here's my setting, here's my results. And the penetration tester could say, okay, change your settings and configuration to be this, run a new set of tests, and run them in parallel to everything you're doing, and you actually will get more data for them and for auditing and for yourself. 
Oh yeah, the chances are your pen testing team will be using similar tool anyway, if not the same tool. I mean, we had that now and then, you know, our customers tell us, okay, our pen testing, you know, uh, team came in and while they are going, they recommended NetSparker to us. So yeah. when they arrive, instead of them running it, we already run it throughout the year or throughout the month and they just go ahead and work on the other bits that we fixed all the automated stuff that can be found by NetSpark already. And they also come up and recommend new changes to NetSpark for new vulnerabilities and new All right, things. yeah. So because yeah. it becomes more continuous, it's continuous testing and, sec and monitoring and security testing and not only functional testing, it's not, a penetration test is maybe every, every quarter, every half year, every year, depending on the organization. That's a point in time test. You need continuous, you need ongoing, mm -hmm. you need something that's actionable today, something that will actually stop a vulnerability from going out that's serious, serious enough. Now, granted, serious enough is a judgment call. I mean, no one's gonna block everything because I stopped an esoteric SQL injection, and there are a few of those, but you know what? It better be fixed on the next release, and that next release may be coming 20 minutes down the road. Right, right. Right? It depends on how fast you're doing these deployments. If it takes months to deploy, eh, you may want to stop. <laughs> but if you're doing continuous integration, continuous deployment with rollback, as the tests finish in your, your parallel testing, you'll know if you have to roll back or continue on to the next one. Mm -hmm. And that's just going to, you, you also may have to stop and restart them because you're, you're constantly deploying new things. And you got to keep right. all this in mind. And I think the developers need to be using this as a, a just as a matter of course. I really do. I mean, you should not be building without testing at this level because, you know, as you said, you don't know what you don't know. No. The developers are not security folks. We know this. Everybody knows this. This is, this is important to realize. That's it. Also, you know, that, that's something I keep telling as well. I mean, I cannot... I. I was a developer when I first started, so I've done development and also I was a developer in the NetSparker team as well. So I know how it works and as a developer, your focus is shipping stuff. Yep. And as a security guard, your focus is way different. You are working on how to secure and how to break stuff. But the thing is, development by itself and the security by itself is such a big field. You cannot expect your, you know, any developer, you cannot expect your casual developer, unless they got a special interest in security, to keep up to date with everything on security because it's just not feasible. It's no, just no. not realistic. Well, that's why I think that you need, that I think most companies need to actually find those, those people that have the developers with a security mindset and, and grow them and, and nurture them so that they can actually be part of the industry to keep that overlap because, to be honest, that overlap doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And that it yeah. needs to. You and I both know it needs to. And maybe that nurture that. If you find them in your team, nurture them. Don't don't push them into the security team. Don't move them from. Don't push them. Say don't worry about that. Nurture them so they can be that bridge between the two teams. That's absolutely required today. This right. Is, this is a foreign, right. I mean, is a foreign language almost. Security mind is definitely something you need to train, you know, you, you want your developer to be aware what is an input, what I need to encode, what I need to secure against, what is whitelisting, what is blacklisting. I think these are all basics. If you don't know this, if you don't train your developers to understand these basic concepts, you will never run out of security issues. You know, <laughs> you, will, you will keep getting them. You know, you're not going to solve the problem. But even after you know all of that, you cannot expect your developer to know every single new vulnerability or every single edge case. And that's all, even the best practice. You know, the last one year or the two years was quite exciting. We got so many new security features in browsers and in HTTP standards. And that effectively means, you know, you might expect some developers to keep up to date with them. But not everyone will be able to do so. So when we have new features like same site cookies, now cookie prefixes are coming in and HSTS is quite new. We got uh, public key pinning, HTTP public key pinning. So there are like new stuff coming in. And if you go ahead, a, any random web application development company, pick 10 developers, ask these full new technologies and I, I think the best you will hear, yeah, I've heard of that. I, I don't know what is it though.
you well, know, if, they've heard of it, this, if they've heard of it, this is a step in the right direction. <laughs> right, Nurture right. those people, make sure that they learn, it gives, get time to learn those technologies so that you can test against them and, and actually code against them the right way. And those are the ones who I, need, I think that are going to be the security developers. As I said, right. they're still developers, but they're nurtured in a security mindset. Right. And they're not really, they don't really want to be part of the security team because, to be honest, the security teams in most companies today are all about compliance or checkboxes. Vulnerabilities come in at the code level. They don't come in at the infrastructure level. It's at the code level. There's a coding mistake. That's where it is. I can protect the infrastructure. Most companies can. That's mitigation right. downstream. But when you start talking about people coming in over port 443 or HTTPS mm -hmm. and there's a vulnerability still, that's not a good thing. That's a code problem. There's no infrastructure. There's no web application firewall that's going to protect you from well-known attacks against what you release out into the public, the things you open up and have to open up for the application. Right. Yeah, that's that's what the you know that's the core of web application security problem today. You know, we coming from historically a firewall, anti malware, that kind of centric endpoint security centric security culture. And now even though the web is massive, it's still very underestimated. And the one thing I keep telling recently, look, think about the last twenty big hacks you can find or you can think of. Now tell me What's the percentage of those hacks happened because Firewall was misconfigured, because they were running out-of-date servers? None. You don't see that. No. Nope. Wherever you look at, there's a SQL injection hack. There is a command execution hack. And there the is someone is, managed to upload a backdoor. No, there, are some, there, are, there are some tools that can mitigate SQL injections upstream. There's only a couple of them. And they're very, very big. I mean, for example, you put them before your database, a SQL database, Oracle, mm -hmm. SQL, MySQL, and others, Postgres. And there's a few of those out there. And when you find, if you need them, you'll need them because your application is maybe A, too old. No one knows right. how to fix it anymore. Or you just want it as a secondary layer of defense. They're worth having. But you've got to keep their rules up to date as well because these things are constantly changing. <laughs> right. And they do. They have threat feeds and they have testing feeds and they have all this. And that's that's good. But you can't just rely on them. You oh, well, to, I mean, that's, that's a great point. Any, any blanket solution, like web application firewall, or I attach this and I don't have SQL injection anymore, or I've done this, I don't have cross-site scripting anymore, any of these can be bypassed and will be bypassed and we have proven this by the history. To give you very simple examples, like ASP.NET cross-site request protection is, is broken so many times and even today it doesn't protect against every single case. So and another good example, Mod Security is a well-known web application firewall. So what they did as Mod Security, they run a competition. So they said, okay, here's a vulnerable application can you hack it when more security is deployed? And you know what? I, I can't remember the exact details, but there were about five or ten bypasses. Yeah. You know, just because there was a competition, these people just because they, they want to, you know, win that competition or, you know, be there or whatever, they just gone through and found brand new five to ten bypasses in web application firewall. So, the thing about all these solutions, you know, given the enough amount of time, you will see bypasses because they are fixing the problem in the wrong place. Having said all of this, as you said, it's very good idea to keep it defense in depth. So this is not something against web application firewall. It's the idea know what it is and use it for what is it what, what it is for. Well, that's that's know, the critical you, you, bit. You definitely know why. And if you can get one of these SQL injection mitigation tools that do exist, that's actually that's a good defense in depth. But you still need to have find out what's in your vulnerability inside of your application to fix. Now, if you have one of these mitigation tools and you can mitigate using those, you should. But you should know how to do that, and by knowing what is the vulnerability that you're trying to mitigate, and that's mm. where tools like NetSpark are come in. Right. Now, um, right. We're at the close of our hour. Um, Faru, do you have a closing thought? No. Well, thanks a lot for having me. It's my pleasure. And 
continuous integration is something, you know, that's, that's our way to go. When, when we talk with the customers, like, okay, how do I do this? And we tell them, look, this is the right way to do it. You want it on the continuous integration level, and you want to fix them as they come in. You want to learn from them, and, you know, this tool does that. It finds it, and it tells you, it trains your developer if they care about enough to read it. And hopefully, by doing so, eventually, you will automatically train them and you will have much more secure applications. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Faro. That was very thoughtful, and I, I agree with you. Defense in depth all the way. Fix your code. Use a tool like this mm -hmm. and other things. That's, that's wonderful. And I actually think it is part of your continuous integration, continuous deployment toolbox. And a must, in my opinion. Thank you for being on the Virtualization and Cloud Security uh, podcast. I appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Thank you.